joy of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it and how from infancy you have known the scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. During World War II, Boris Dosensko was a brilliant atheist. He was smart. He majored in physics and mathematics, and he went on to get a PhD in physics. Then a strange thing happened to him. He was appointed as the head of Russia's nuclear laboratory. He was brilliant. He was visiting his grandfather one day, and uh, something influential happened to him. While he was visiting his grandfather, he discovered some old papers and books in a barn near his grandfather's house. One of the books in Russian said, The Gospel of Our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he had been taught that the Bible was nothing more than myth and nonsense, Dr. Donsensko began to read it. He began to study it, and as he read it, he started to apply it to his life, and then wonderful and unbelievable things happened to him. Through the reading of scripture, this brilliant Russian physicist discovered the meaning of life. He discovered purpose, which he never knew. He received a peace and a hope through Christ, and the very things that he sought all his life but eluded him now came to him as he read the scriptures and opened his heart to the one who is written above. He says that his life was unbelievably transformed just by reading and studying and applying that book to his life. It's the inspired word of God. But you know, some people today, I've heard, you've heard, they say, it's not really the inspired word of God. It's just one book among many, the Koran and a host of others. But it's just one book, it's no different. And so the question that we all have to relate to is, has God really spoken to us through the scriptures, or is it just another book? Many people will say, uh, many people are quick to say, oh, it's just a product of man. Man wrote it, it's not from God. Where do you get that idea? And they go on to say that it's evolved through the years. I've had people tell me time and time again that what's written in our Bible today wasn't what was in it 2,000 years ago. But they're not right. right. They're wrong. And I really want to share you some morning some evidence, some things that point to the fact that this is indeed God's word. Because my faith stands or falls on this. Either it's true or it's false. And we need to know evidence. One of the things I always contend with is so many people go through life as Christians and they know what they believe, but they don't know why they believe it. And if you don't know why you believe it, your faith is going to crumble. I believe scripture is God's word. And I'm fortunate I know why I believe it. And I want to just share with you a few reasons this morning as to why we can trust this, that it really is God's word. It is not just another book. Writing to Timothy, the Apostle Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The NIV translates inspiration as God-breathed. So something that's inspired by God is God-breathed. This means that God, through the Holy Spirit, worked in a unique, supernatural way so that the written word in this Bible is exactly what God once revealed to us. And the process didn't destroy the individuality of the writers. That still comes through as you read it. And God, through his spirit, used the personalities, the vocabularies, the writing styles, 
that these writers wrote and put the scripture out for us to have. Scripture is really a product of the Holy Spirit revealing things to us. And it bears God's own perfection and it has his authority. The Bible reflects the very mind and the will of God. And we can be sure of that no matter what anyone else says. You can be sure of it if you know the evidence. And that's what our focus is on this morning. We need to know the evidence. It's interesting, King, King David said in Chronicles, the spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. In other words, God revealed things for King David to say. We have them in scripture. And God told Jeremiah in the first chapter, he said to him, you must say whatever I command you. And God went on to say to Jeremiah, I'm putting my words in your mouth. Can we believe that? Absolutely. And I want to share with you just some evidence that when somebody tells you this is just another book, you can fall back on, and it represents proof that this is not just another book, it's the very word of God. First of all, there is fulfilled prophecy. One of the most convincing arguments for the claim that God is the ultimate author of the Bible is fulfilled prophecy. The Bible is the only book ever produced in which there is to be found large bodies of prophecies that have to do with nations like Israel, cities, and the coming of Christ. The prophecy there is amazing. The Old Testament contains over 300 references to the coming of Christ. Centuries before Christ was born, Isaiah wrote that Jesus Christ was coming and he'd be born of a virgin. How did Isaiah know that? How did he know it hundreds of years before Christ was born? I'll tell you how he knew it. Peter says, holy men of God spoke as they what? Were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's how he knew it. It's not just another book. The prophet Micah prophesied that the pre-existent Christ would come to earth and he'd be born in Bethlehem. How did Micah know those facts long before Christ came? What enabled the psalmist in Psalm 22 to say that Christ's hands and feet would be pierced and he would be betrayed by a friend? How did the psalmist know that way before Christ even came to earth? And there are countless other prophecies. There's only one way they know it. God revealed it to them. Holy men of God spoke as what? As God revealed truths to them. There are hundreds and hundreds of fulfilled prophecies concerning all kinds of things. Amos has them. Jeremiah has them. Ezekiel has them. They talk about God's people being scattered and then returning to the land of Israel. And on May 14, 1948, there was the independent state of Israel. How did the prophets know these things? Simply because, as Peter said, holy men of God spoke as what? As God touched them through the Holy Spirit. They were moved by the Spirit of God. To the open mind, someone would say, well, this is just another book. And you say to them, how do you explain all, of the, all the prophecies? There's no other way to explain it except it's God's what? Reveal book. It's not just another book. The other thing, another evidence for me when somebody tries to tell me that's just another book, not only do I think of the fulfilled prophecy, I think of the harmony and the unity that's in this book, and it certainly attests to its divine authorship. Do you know this Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years? It has more than 40 different authors from every walk of life. Some were kings, peasants, fishermen, philosophers, laborers, scholars, you name it. Yet it has a singleness of theme and a oneness of purpose that defies explanation other than the fact that holy men of God spoke as they were what? Moved by God. There's no other explanation. How can you explain it? How can there be such unity? Simply because holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When somebody tells me it's just another book, my mind goes right to all the fulfilled prophecy. It goes to the unity and the harmony of scriptures. And I say, it can't be just another book. It's divinely inspired. You can trust it. But then there's some other things that, for me, when somebody says it's just another book, I think of 
the fulfilled prophecy, I think of its unity and harmony that defies explanation written over such a large period of time by so many folks, half of whom didn't even know each other. There is, it's survival. You can certainly relate to this, that its survival attests to its divine authorship. The very existence of the Bible today sets it apart from every other writing and points to its divine origin. You would agree with me that no other book has been so vigorously attacked for so long and by so many. Certainly that's the case today. Relentless attempts to destroy the scriptures would have consigned it to oblivion if it had not been divinely inspired. In AD 30, 33, Diocletian, the emperor, the mightiest emperor of the mightiest empire in the world, decreed that every single Bible was to be burned and anyone who possessed one would be put to death. Voltaire was a famous French philosopher and infidel. He was a skeptic, and his life goal was to destroy the Bible and all of its contents. Ironically, after he died, the home he lived in, the Geneva Bible Study purchased it, and they started printing Bibles in his home. For 2,000 years, critics have attacked the scriptures. They discredited it. They dismissed it as the word of God. Yet it stands today as solid as a rock. Its circulation increases, and its impact multiplies with every passing day. How do you explain that? To me, the only explanation is holy men of God spoke as they were what? Moved by the living God. When somebody tells me it's just another book, my mind goes to the fact that through the years, people have tried to destroy it yet they've been unsuccessful. But there are a lot of other reasons. I'm just giving you five or six this morning. There are so many. The other one is archaeological discoveries. In my years of ministry, I encountered folk who were skeptics that some of them would say to me, you know, all this archaeological stuff proves that this isn't true. Well, anybody who has any academic background in archaeology and scripture would never make a statement like that. The evidence is overwhelmingly pointing to its divine origin. If the Bible is the inspired word of God, the one thing that we would expect, it would be accurate and historical. Hence, throughout the years, critics have attacked its reliability and its historicity. They try to say it isn't historical. That's how they get at it. Archaeology has not, however, supported the critics' claim. Two of the most acclaimed archaeologists in the world, one was a Yale University professor, Dr. Miller Burroughs said, quote, the excessive skepticism of many stems not from a careful evaluation of the data, but from an enormous predisposition against the supernatural. He went on to say, people say archaeology proves the Bible isn't historical. He, as a leading archaeologist, said, that's nonsense. And Dr. Nelson Gluck is one of the most famous archaeologists in the world. And he said, this is a quote, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a single properly understood biblical account. That's amazing. And folks today will say it's not historical. It is. The very stones cry out telling us that the Bible is true. It's been interesting over and over through the years, people have come along who didn't believe in the scriptures and they want to get at its reliability or historicity. And so what they say is that... Uh, it's just not true. And for years, folks were saying, skeptics, that David in the Old Testament, King David, was really not a historical figure. And therefore, they said the Bible isn't true. But in 1993, an excavation unearthed a 9th century B.C. tablet. And guess whose name was on it? King David, the house of David. So they had to stop that argument. In 1961, there was no <coughs> archaeological evidence for Pontius Pilate. And for years, I'd read about skeptics saying, the Bible isn't true because history doesn't record anything about Pontius Pilate. Only the Bible records them. It's just not historical. And guess what? In 1961, they came across fragments, and it had Pontius Pilate all over it. Throughout the years, so many critics have said that the Bible can't be trusted because it's not what it was originally. Archaeology proves just the reverse. Many people today, I'm encountering them in ministry. They didn't want to believe the Bible, so they said to me, well, you know, through the years, it's changed. What you have today is not what was there 2,000 years ago. And through the years, it's been added to, and the words have been changed, et cetera, et cetera. 
Is that claim true, or is it a bold-faced lie? It's absolutely a bold-faced lie. Archaeology does not support their claim. In fact, just the opposite is true. In 1947, there was a Bedouin farmer in Israel, and he was plowing. And he picked up a stone, what came off of his harrow, and he threw it. It landed in a cave, and he heard something shatter. And they went in the cave, and there were enormous amount of tablets. They come to, came to be the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's interesting. You can see the Dead Sea Scrolls in a number of museums today in Israel and England. And these Dead Sea Scrolls represent portions of our Old Testament. And they go back a 1,000 years older than any other manuscript that we had. And you know the interesting thing about it is the Dead Sea Scrolls are exactly the same word for word as what we have in the Hebrew in our Bible today. And that proves that it hasn't what? Hasn't changed at all, yet people say it. Archaeology does not support that, but some people continue to insist that. It's so interesting. I've heard people say, well, you know, you only have a lot of manuscripts of this thing, and, and it's changed. And we read Homer and the Iliad, and we read some of these ancient writers, and the Bible has thousands of times more pieces of early manuscripts than Homer or any of these things. And yet we accept that because people say they can't accept scripture. It's interesting when you think about it that there is presently more than 5,000 copies of Greek manuscripts of parts of the scripture. There are 20,000 portions in Latin, Coptic, and Syriac, which completely supports this. So it's interesting. When you hear people say this, it just isn't true. Archaeology does not get rid of scripture. Dr. Lambert Dolphin, you can probably go online and find out about him. He's a physics professor at Stanford, brilliant guy. And all of his life he was searching for some meaning and some purpose. And he'd been told in the back of his mind that this Bible is just another book, not too, not too important, and it's just myth, don't bother with it. And so he went through life ignoring it. And he was enamored with physics and all kinds of things. He studied, studied under a Nobel Prize winner at Stanford University. And in spite of all of his accomplishments, he was left with a sense that he lived in a cold, impersonal, and meaningless universe. So he moved on and started studying philosophy. He got away from physics and said, maybe I can find the answers to life in philosophy, hoping that his search for meaning and peace would find fulfillment, but it didn't. He continued on. He decided to study classical Freudian psychiatry. And so he began to study all of that. It left him empty, unsatisfied and hopeless. You think a man that had a PhD in physics would have some meaning? He had none whatsoever in life. He turns his thoughts to astrology. He says, maybe this will give me some meaning. His life turned from bad to worse. He began drinking more and more. His life was absolutely empty, yet he was a brilliant PhD in physics. Something was missing. He was unhappy. He was perplexed. And he said he was going to commit suicide. But one day, he was at the end of his rope, and a friend of his said to him, why don't you come to church with me? He didn't really want to go to church because it was based on this Bible, this thing he didn't believe. And so he said, I've tried everything else. Maybe I'll go with my friend. At church, Dr. Dolphin, the brilliant physicist, encountered the scriptures. Everything centered around it. And he didn't believe it for all these years. And so he was reserved, resolved to turn all of his energies to the scriptures, and he was going to look into its flaws, its inconsistencies, and its errors, and prove it wrong, get that behind him. He began to study the scriptures. And in studying the scriptures, he discovered Christ. He went on to receive him as his Savior and Lord. And his life was gloriously changed for the better. He found meaning and purpose and hope and a whole new mission in life. Something he never had before. God does indeed speak to us through his word. If we read it, if we're open to it. You can go online, I think, still today. Look up Dr. Stanford Dolphin and... Uh, find out about him. He turned his whole life around and he began spending all his time online witnessing to scientific endeavors for folks to say how Christ can change your life. It's amazing. Scripture is so unique. It's not just another book. 
And the uniqueness of Scripture is also to be found in its unbelievable relevancy. It was written 2,000 years ago, yet it still speaks to us today. It turned Dr. Dolphin's life all the way around. How can a book written 2,000 years ago affect people today? Because holy men of God spoke as they were what? Moved by the Spirit of God. The Bible today still stands amidst all of the changes. It's still relevant. It still helps us understand the human condition and our human predicament. Its truths have never been outdated. Its principles apply today in the 21st century just as much as they did in the first century. It continues to have an uncanny ability to speak to our human longings and our deepest fears. It speaks with a force and the freshness that is still up to date. It knows my deepest needs and it tells me how to find forgiveness and meaning and hope and how to find victory over sin. What other book can do that? It's able to feed the mind. It's able to nourish the soul. It's able to lift the spirit. It's able to transform a life. I ask you why? Simply because holy men of God spoke as they were what? Moved by the spirit of God. It's not just another book. One last illustration. Dr. Emile Collier is a brilliant French scientist, and he was appointed by General de Gaulle to the French Academy of Science. In spite of his intellect, his life was empty. He began to write a book, and he titled it The Book That Understands Me. In all his philosophical writings, readings, he would rip out little parts of these things that applied to him, and he'd put it in a book. And one day his wife was out near Notre Dame Cathedral. She was pushing a baby carriage. And the priest came out from there and gave her a copy of the Bible. She'd never seen one before. She brought it home to Dr. Emile Collier, this brilliant French academic. And he'd never in his whole life opened a scripture. He was at the end of his line trying to find meaning in existence, writing his own book. And so she said to him, why don't you read this? Dr. Collier began to read it. He opened it. He said, I started reading with the Beatitudes. He said, I read and I read. And as I read, an incredible warmth overtook me. Something was surging within. He said, I found words to describe my awe and my wonder. And as he pondered and meditated upon his teaching and truths, he found satisfying answers to life's deepest questions. Ultimately, he came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, and his whole life was completely transformed. He took that little book he was writing that said, a book that understands me, understands me, he threw it out, and he said, here's the book that understands me. And he spent the rest of his life, when he came to Princeton University, talking about Jesus Christ, who's found in the scriptures. How could that book change his life, this brilliant academic? Because the word of God, scripture says, is alive and powerful. It's the living word of the living God. You can be absolutely certain of that. You can stake your life on it. All the evidence points to the fact that it's not just another book. No wonder in, Com in Colossians we're commanded to let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Another translation says, let it have ample room in your heart and your life. Another translation says, let it remain as a rich treasure. The word of God is supposed to dwell in my heart and my mind. I'm supposed to ponder it and meditate upon it. I'm expected to feast upon it, to allow it to nourish my soul and give me much needed direction and guidance in life. And as the psalmist declares, scripture is intended to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Without scriptures, we lose our way. We shipwreck our lives. Let me conclude with this illustration from literature. Elizabeth Barrett was the wife of Robert Browning. He was the famous English poet. Her parents disapproved of her marriage, so they literally disowned her when she wanted to marry him. Elizabeth, however, wrote almost every single week telling her parents that she loved them and she wanted a recon reconciliation with them. After 10 years of writing almost every day, she received a huge box in the mail from her mother and father containing every single letter she'd written and not a one of them was opened. How different things would have been if they'd only opened the letters. May I conclude that God's word is God's what? Love letters to you and to me. God's word is presented as a love letter. 
And through the Bible, he tells us that he loves us. He tells us how he's provided for us and how he wants to lead us and guide us, how he wants to forgive us and help us find meaning and hope and how to gain eternal life. Yet many today never even open and read his life-changing, life-lifting love letters. May that not be the case with us. May God help us to make his word, the divinely inspired word of God, an absolute priority in our lives. May we, along with the words of Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Let's pray. Lord, it's so easy today to get shipwrecked, to turn the wrong way, head down the wrong paths. We need a word from you, and we thank you that evidence makes it so clear that the Bible is not just another book. It's a divinely inspired word of God. Holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the Spirit of God. Help us day by day to find great strength and help as we read and study your word. May it be a light unto our path. May it guide us day by day. And we thank you so greatly for it. And we thank you in our Redeemer's name. Amen. And so, you know, at this point in time, um, there is um, something to be dealt with, right? And so if this spoke to you today, that this is the inspired word of God, that he came to earth <laughs> of a virgin, he then walked the earth 33 years sin-free, he shed his blood for our sin. And he rose again on the third day in fulfillment of the scriptures that we could have eternal life. He does ask that we repent. Just simply means you're going this way and you're deciding, you know what? At the end of my life, I want to be going this way with Jesus. Something crazy happens. He gives us the promise of the Holy Spirit. He comes in to help us fulfill that which he requires us to do. And all we simply have to do is submit to his authority and his grace in our lives. So if that speaks to you today, Gordon had asked, Pastor Gordon had asked that I just give an invitation as the girls play a song to just pray in your heart as we stand and uh, just let them, you know, let God do his work in your heart. If he's spoken to your heart, then you can pray right where you are and ask the Lord to come in and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus. 